Well, aloha everyone and welcome again to the Grassroot Institute. We're just delighted to have you here today. Uh, we're here today because we envision, all of us together, an economy that functions the way economies are supposed to function. And there are battles that are taking place over policy measures and sometimes we don't look at the long-term picture and the impact on our policy. Uh, for example, you know that we have very bad traffic in Honolulu. We can give you the statistics as to how we rank in some of the, with some of the worst traffic conditions across the nation. And you know that there have been attempts to solve that problem. One attempt which has taken the focus of our people here in the state and now is a national issue is the Honolulu Rail, the Honolulu Area Rapid Transit. It is a form of technology that is cutting edge for the 19th century. It, 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 it is going to be one of the most expensive public works project. But there are legitimate reasons that people have proposed it, and there are legitimate reasons people have opposed it. At the Grassroot Institute, uh, we look at various kinds of issues, and we don't think in the short term. We try to think in the long term. And there's one area where there are some short-term policies being made about Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and other forms of what we call the shared economy. Rather than deal with them in the short run, let's look at the long run. At the Grassroot Institute, we believe that a functioning economy needs to give individuals many things. We call this free market principles. Here's one. Property rights, personal property rights. For example, if you own a home and you actually own it, you can do with the bedroom or the living room couch what you choose. How many of you believe that that's just a basic right? <laughs> and, and that the government should not tell you you can't loan your couch to someone or rent your bedroom to someone and so forth. So we believe that that's something the public needs to rally around, protecting personal property rights. Here's a second one in a free market economy competition. The kind of competition between providers that gives choice to people, whether they are choosing the school for their children or choosing the way they get across the island or choosing what accommodation they stay in. How many of you think it's better for people to have more choices and better for companies to be able to compete rather than told they can't play in the game? Isn't that better? Yeah. And that builds a stronger economy. Then third, limited government intervention. In other words, we do need government for some things because we don't want everybody to take murdering criminals into their, I mean, killing and executing criminals who murder people, take that into their own hands. I don't want my neighborhood operating an execution chamber or whatever it may be. <laughs> there are some limited roles government does play. I do like the fact that people have to keep their word on contracts and so forth. But let's keep government li limited. Let's not let government say which industries should thrive and which industries should not thrive, which players in industry games should be able to compete and which shouldn't. How many of you believe we should have limited government? Isn't that a good thing? All right. Now, I could go on with a few more principles, but put them together. They're the principles of a free market society, and our research shows across the world a consistent result, and we're part of a research project at the Grassroot Institute called the Economic Freedom of the World from Fraser Institute in Canada, which measures the free market status of countries and cities across the world. Well, here's what we find. Where these principles I've just told you about exist, you have the highest levels of economic development, you have the highest levels of prosperity, and you have the lowest levels of poverty. But where these principles are not in play, you have the highest levels of poverty and the, less, the least amount of economic development. Now that's the, what the data shows. So we have a choice here in Hawaii. We can pursue policies in line with these free market principles and have a great economy, or we can do the opposite. Today we're bringing Jared Mayer because he's a national voice speaking to economies built around free market principles. He's a member of the Foundation for Government Accountability. He's a senior research fellow with that organization. He's done a great deal of work studying how government policy impacts the labor market. I'd love to have him back here to talk about that and our labor markets in Hawaii and the unions, but today he's talking about something else that comes under his area of expertise. He's an expert in disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies are those that hit the market 
and they challenge monopolies, they challenge the way people have done things for a long time. They offer new opportunities, both for providers of economic services and for consumers. And we've seen some of those dis disruptive technologies hit Hawaii, such as in the taxi and uh, ride sharing industry, Uber, Lyft, and so forth. Jared's gonna share some perspectives nationally that affect us locally about the shared economy in, in terms of homestay. He's a terrific guy who is one of the up and coming millennials changing the way people in America think about technology and economics. Please welcome Jared Mayer. Jared, thank you. Jared. Thank you. Jared has just come back from Maui where we had a great presentation. This is your podium over here. Oh. Unless you're going to be a little I'm more be walking around. You're a little more right. disruptive in your technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. So, thanks Dr. Akina. This is uh, and the Grassroots Institute in general. Thank you. And let me just interject oh. before handing it completely over to you. Jared is open to questions and he wants to take your questions. So, go ahead and jot them down and you'll be able to come up to that microphone. We'll put a microphone over there where you can come up and ask your questions later on. Thank you. Okay, Jared. Yeah, as he said, my favorite part of this is the Q&A, getting your thoughts on this. That's how I learn and then make my other lectures hopefully better than this one then. But I'm gonna be here, I'm gonna try to do my best to keep you awake, especially after eating lunch. I know I, I've been laying out in the sun for the last week here in Hawaii. I can't, I can't thank Grassroot enough for bringing me out. But we're gonna make this interesting. I'm gonna lay out about 15, 20 minutes on how the economy is changing and how that ties into companies like Uber and Airbnb and all the regulatory battles that you're going through right here in Hawaii. And then we're gonna go over some of the main opposition to this new economy because there's a lot of it. And it really fits into three categories. The first type of opposition is saying that these companies are unregulated and this makes it very bad for consumers. The second type of opposition is that these companies are just a bunch of you know, rich people living in San Francisco, these you know, millennials wearing hoodies, ruining all the good paying jobs for everyone else, and it's not standing up for progressive values like caring about low income people or the middle class. And the third is that this new ways that work, the new way that works changing through companies like Uber is terrible for workers and it's going to destroy, again, the middle class. So I kind of like to fit this all into what I call the Bernie Sanders opposition to Uber and Airbnb. And I mean, Bernie Sanders just laid it out for himself. When he had a Bloomberg reporter ask him what he thought of Uber, he just said, I'm not a fan of Uber, you can quote me on that. So that's what he brought up, but why isn't he a fan of Uber? Again, he called the companies unregulated, which is something similar to what Elizabeth Warren said when she gave an address on the sharing economy. And also, then we have people like Hillary Clinton. When she was asked about Uber, she said it's great, except for it only succeeds because it takes advantage of workers. And these people are making billions of dollars by taking advantage of people. And then we even had your own Senator Schatz filing a letter with the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, asking them to investigate Airbnb for increasing rents and make it so low-income individuals couldn't afford housing. We had <laughs> Mayor Bill de Blasio in New York he was saying that these companies fight against their progressive New York values. I'm gonna go through all of these different complaints about the sharing economy and explain to you why they are all wrong. And then hopefully, when you hear them, you'll be able to come back and say, hey, look at the data, look at the economic trends, I'm right, you're wrong. So, where to start? First, I guess I should define what the sharing economy is, and I wanna make it clear. I'm gonna use Uber and Airbnb as examples a lot because it's something most people are familiar with. Like, have any of you ever taken an Uber before? How about stay in an Airbnb or rented out your house? So yeah, it's something that people understand, so I use it a lot. But I don't work for Uber and Airbnb, and despite my best efforts, they still don't give me like free rides or free stays for life. So unfortunately, uh, I don't work with them, I just think they're a good way to explain this. And secondly, even though I'm going to talk about these two companies, the sharing economy goes far, far beyond Uber and Airbnb. What it is is a fundamental shift in how Americans are consuming and working. And the way I describe this, I'm, I'm gonna keep it down to a minimum of using economic jargon, but the first term I wanna make sure we all understand is transaction costs. What transaction costs are is how much time and effort and money it takes to make a trade with someone. So theoretically, if I was here in Honolulu, let's say 20 years ago, I could have walked to all your houses or condos, knocked on the door, and asked you if you had an extra couch or a room for me to stay in. 
I probably would have wanted to ask for some references too to make sure you weren't gonna murder me or anything like that. But this is possible. I could have done an Airbnb style home ship. Could have went up to you. But why didn't that happen? Because the transaction costs were too high. It would take a long time to go to all these different homes. And then how am I gonna compare prices? Just think of the cost and the consumer empowerment that you didn't have, and then all the different time it's going to take. Now what happens? You hop on your phone, you hop on your computer with a few clicks or a few taps on your screen. You can find hundreds of places to stay and compare all of those. Same with Uber. I could have walked up to your car and knocked on the window. I, I don't advise doing this, but you could have done that and asked, me, uh, asked you to take me to this talk. Then I would have to figure out how much you were going to pay me if you were going in that general direction anyways. And also if you just wanted me in your car. All these different things. It was possible, but it didn't happen because it was too costly. So Uber and Airbnb are taking advantage of what technology has done, which is substantially lower transaction cost across the board. So we see this in almost all types of work and all ways that consumers are able to operate, where it's becoming easier and cheaper with more information. So how does this tie into that quote from Bernie Sanders that Uber and Airbnb are unregulated? Well, unlike Bernie Sanders, I think there's more ways to regulate than through government. I think consumers can do a pretty good job of regulating because of all the information we have at our fingertips now. I mean, how many of you, when you're trying to figure out where to go out to eat tonight, are going to call up the you know, Honolulu Department of Restaurants or whatever you have <laughs> and ask them to see a food safety inspection score for the restaurant? No, you're going to go on Google reviews. You're going to go on Yelp. You're going to talk to some of your friends on Facebook. You're going to see where they checked in on Foursquare. Social media and all the other types of online interaction that we can have now are giving more power to consumers. Because think, every transaction has three parts. You have the buyer, what they can do, like you control what you want to buy. Sellers control what they want to sell. But that third part, which is critical, is all the information about this transaction. In the past, this information was controlled, if not you know, heavily influenced by the sellers. Now it's entirely flipped. Information's in the hands of consumers, and we can see this with things like Uber and Airbnb, with the ratings that drivers and riders get. And yes, on Uber, you have your own rating, and it's a direct correlation with how good of a person you are. So you want to make sure yeah, the driver afterwards gives you a rating, uh, you can check it. Uh, but so what we have right now is that more information is allowing people to really get, a, I would say, ahead of government regulation. Because what's the point of most regulation? I'm not talking like environmental impact or looking at uh, externalities or any of that. But information is supposed to uh, correct that asymmetry we had before where sellers controlled all that information. It's changed. I don't think we need as much regulation. I'm not saying, I'm not naive enough to think businesses are going to regulate themselves, but I think consumers are more than ever before able to hold businesses accountable. Uh, an example I'd like to use, and I didn't want to name names, but I think I'm just going to do it anyways. Uh, I made the mistake of flying Frontier Airlines once. Uh, that then turned into me waiting about eight hours in the airport in Atlanta, constantly boarding, then onboarding planes, and then no one helping me. So I was finally frustrated enough, I went on Twitter, tweeted to like all my 20 followers about how mad I was at Frontier <laughs> Airlines. Within a few minutes, I get a response from someone at Frontier over Twitter updating me on what's going on, just apologizing over and over, and then asking for my contact information. So I give it to them, and finally, I, I make my flight. But a few days later, I get an email from them with a full refund from my flight and enough money to then fly round trip to Cancun for free. I, I'm going to go out there and say this. Ten years ago, that would not have happened. This is something that the market has entirely changed. So now, I mean, I'm still probably not going to fly Frontier Airlines, but I'm not going to be sending out <laughs> angry texts about that. And imagine, you know, that decade ago, what could I have done? I could have called my mom and complained to her. Uh, I mean, that could have happened. But how many people am I reaching with that? Versus, you know, my 20 followers on Twitter, real opinion makers by doing this. It's making companies, they're more worried about a negative report from a consumer than they are from a negative report from a regulator. And just to show you a little more about how this extends so far throughout the economy, my mom, when I was growing up, she would have a little side business where she'd go to flea markets and sell these things called mittens. I don't know if you in Hawaii know what mittens are, but they're things that you, you put them on your hand when it's cold, which means the sun isn't out and you like, can't go to the beach. But my mom would make these things out of old sweaters and sell them at flea markets. And you know, maybe she'd sell 25. But now, with sites like Etsy, these online platforms for handmade goods, or eBay, 
eBay is a part of what I would call the sharing economy. She can reach theoretically anyone in the world. And we've seen big businesses grow from just starting in someone's garage. You went from being able to reach your neighborhood and your network and those people you could find at a craft fair to now being able to reach the entire world. That's the transformation we're seeing that's made Uber and Airbnb possible. So no, Bernie Sanders, these companies are regulated. There's just two ways to regulate, through consumers and government. And consumers are more than ever before able to do that. So the next critique I want to look at is that these companies fight against progressive values, particularly caring for low-income people in the middle class. And with Airbnb, you see this all the time. All anyone talks about, especially in Hawaii when I was doing my research for this talk, is how Airbnb is the only reason that rents are high in Honolulu. Because we all know that before 2008, before Airbnb was founded, you could get a beautiful three-bedroom condo right on the water for 100 bucks a month, right? Now that's all. Now Airbnb ruined all that. But just looking at the data shows that this argument is completely ridiculous. And we'll go a little bit into some of the other points, but I just want to lay this out to start it. So there's half a million housing units in all the entire state of Hawaii. Out of that, last year, Airbnb only had 8,000 full units, where it's the entire house or the entire condo being rented out. So 8,000 full units. And out of those, only 970 were rented for over 180 nights a year, so over half the year. And because it's a Friday, and I know none of you want to do math, that means out of the half a million units, at most, at most, 0.2% are being taken off the market because of, let's say, Airbnb that 970 out of half a million. How is that the main cause of high rent increases? Yet you're hearing this argument all throughout the country. I hear it in DC where I live. In New York, it was the reason behind their infamous anti-Airbnb law that they've passed. And I think it's one of the reasons why Hawaii hasn't more fully embraced these services. And Hawaii does have an interesting market because it's got a built up history of short term or vacation rentals. So what we've seen is though, even though Airbnb's doubled its listings in Hawaii every year, really since 2008, the number of short-term rentals on the market has never increased more than 4% in any of those years. So what we've really seen here is a realignment from using inefficient things like a travel agent or having to call and figure out if you can stay somewhere to now going online. It's all that whole idea of now with online, we've moved it to make it more convenient for consumers and easier for people to make money by renting out their homes. And additionally, the average uh, Hawaiian Airbnb host earns $9,000 a year. Now that might not sound like a lot to you, senators way off in DC who are making half a million dollars per speech, but this is a lot of money, especially in Honolulu. I mean, in Hawaii in general, one third of homeowners and half of renters pay at least 35% of their monthly income and housing costs. Both of those are the highest rates in the entire United States. This is something where $9,000 can make a big deal. And again, it's not everyone, I, I understand that some people are going to want to stay at you know, a, a, a Hilton or Hyatt right on the beach with all the amenities, and that's great. There are good things about hotels, they still serve a great purpose. But what we're seeing right now is rather than a fixed high, like just X number of rooms that we have available for people traveling, it's grown. It's giving consumers more options, just like what Dr. Aquino was talking about. This is a way to have competition and expand that pie so that more consumers can travel. Because before, I mean, who can afford $300 a night for a week in Hawaii? There are some college students that could afford you know, $50 a night to stay on a couch. They choose that. They value it more. So I think opening up these options is something that helps people with modest incomes or low-income individuals not only earn money, but also have more options. If we look at things like Uber and Airbnb, in New York City, over an entire year, uh, it was 2014, Uber grew uh, almost eight times as large, from all the rides in January to all the rides in December. So massive growth. And I analyzed every single ride, all the nine million that took place that year in New York City, and what I found was the fastest growth, overwhelmingly, sometimes over a thousand percent, was in low-income outer borough neighborhoods. So it wasn't in downtown and midtown Manhattan, which the reason I wanted to look at this was Mayor Bill de Blasio, like I said, he argued that Uber and Airbnb fought against his progressive values. But then he said the reason they need to ban it is these companies were increasing traffic in downtown and midtown Manhattan. So what someone who's a proud progressive ran to be the mayor of all New York City, 
only cares about you know, people working on Wall Street or in the media companies in Midtown, rather than all those people out in the outer boroughs who elect you. And I lived out in Queens for four years, and I can tell you I never once saw a yellow taxi just drive down my street. <laughs> Whereas it, I mean, it's easy to get one by Penn Station or Grand Central, any of those other places. But when you get out, there weren't transportation options before. When I would try to go home to you know, see my mom for Christmas or something, I'd have to call one of the livery cab companies. It costs about $35 to get out to LaGuardia, and you know half the time they wouldn't show up. I did a talk at my alma mater last year, and it was under $15 to take an Uber. So that's over half a cut in the cost and more convenient. That's something that allows people who truly did not have transportation options before to now get something that was a service for the 1%. Private vehicle transportation has now become affordable. In DC, now because of Uber Pool and Lyft Line where you can share with other riders, it's actually cheaper than the Metro. This is something I wish they would have realized you know, in Honolulu when they're debating how to limit traffic. Why not encourage these carpooling services rather than making them illegal? I know right now you can use it outside of the airport here, but there's islands where they still don't have Uber and Lyft. So allow this, and it'd be such a smaller car. I know it wouldn't be $13 billion or whatever. <laughs> the new, it's probably up to $16 billion just since I started talking. But it would be a whole lot cheaper. So there's a million other examples, and keep in mind, you can, uh, you can ask me anything afterwards. I may not answer it, but you go for it, and we'll get into a lot of these other stories, but I want to keep moving to now the last critique, which is that it's bad for workers. So uh, I was up at my grandpa's 90th birthday party a few weeks ago, and he had this ring that had three diamonds on it, and I asked him what it was from, and an airline ring on it as well. Well, he spent his whole career working at Northwest Airlines after he got out of the Army, and every 10 years of service, he told me, he got a new diamond, and it was for a tie pin. So my grandma had it made into a ring when he retired, and he's like, yeah, you know, it was great, the American middle class, you can work your way up, we need all the manufacturing jobs. And I, I, it was his 90th birthday, so I was decided to be nice to him, but like, no one who's young wants to do that anymore. No one wants to graduate college and then go work at the same company for 30 years. The idea of work, because of this technology, it's changing drastically. If you look at surveys, two-thirds of millennials consistently want to work for themselves or run their own business. This is something, I mean, we all know they're obsessed with Steve Jobs and these other entrepreneurs, but it's because they want to be entrepreneurs themselves. It's not I, what I would say your grandfather's workforce. This is something that is entirely different, where now, because of technology, people can pursue their entrepreneurial dreams. They can start their own business or work as an independent contractor. Actually, with the sharing economy, when I'm talking about these online platforms that connect buyers and sellers, the vast, vast majority of people who are working in this work as independent contractors, which means they don't have all the you know, protections that come with employment, but also they have complete flexibility, and they truly can work for themselves. If you're looking in uh, Hawaii, for example, the, it's over half of Uber drivers here work under seven hours a week. So this isn't something people are doing for full time. It's something more, the majority of them are doing maybe to pay for a night out or to pay for their car payment or help with their mortgage. And same with Airbnb. As I said, it's a $9,000 average that people are making. This isn't full time work, but that's not something to be upset about like Hillary Clinton was where she said it's taking advantage of workers. It's just something people are choosing. Single mothers, they want the flexibility. College students, they want the flexibility. People who are already working another full-time job, they want this flexibility. So I think the changing workforce is something we should embrace, not be scared of. And of course, I, I get a lot of critiques of people where they say, well, you just think everyone's gonna be an Uber driver in 10 years. Well, I like to point out, first, autonomous vehicles are a thing, so not everyone's gonna be an Uber driver. But secondly, again, these trends go far, far beyond just Uber and Airbnb. If someone wants to work as a personal trainer, a graphic designer, a personal chef, an accountant, a lawyer, all these things now, you can work more for yourself and find customers and also show quality through those consumer reviews, through the other market participants that we can get and all the feedback. So I think this is exciting and it's a future of work that we should be, that we shouldn't fear. But so just to recap before we start Q&A, there were three main critiques of this changing economy. The first is that it's unregulated, which no, it's not. 
Second uh, was that it's bad for low-income people in the middle class, which I'm arguing it helps them the most out of anyone. And third is that it's terrible for workers because it, you know the workforce my grandfather grew or lived through is changing. But I think that's exciting as well. So there's a million battles, there's a lot of stories, and I'd love to hear what you all think about this. Thank you. That was a very good presentation, Jared. And if you'd like to ask questions, will you start lining up, please, right here? Because we want to record you. And, uh, yes, absolutely. We're going to do that. And as you come to the microphone over here, and Joe will position you, I do want to mention Jared has written some books that you can take a look at. Uh, and uh, the first one is Disinherited. How Washington is Betraying America's Young. Interesting perspective from somebody in a younger generation. Secondly, Uber Positive. That will come out in about two weeks, but it's already advertised on Amazon. Uber Positive, Why Americans Love the Sharing Economy. So that's a good book. But there's an earlier one you might find interesting to compare with our situation in Hawaii, How Progressive Cities Fight Innovation. Well, actually, that's the same book. No, that's an earlier That's one. the one that's coming out that's in right. two weeks. That's okay. right. Okay. Yeah. How progressive cities fight innovation. Okay. We've got some people coming up. Line up over here, if you will. Yeah. Is this working? <laughs> yeah. Jared, thank you for your comments. You've certainly been enlightening. For those of us who remember a lot of that past, you were talking about. Uh, I'm a little concerned about your thoughts regarding regulation. Uh, if you extend what, you're, what you suggested, ultimately, if the market regulates, people have no recourse through government for protection. And I'll give you an example. Uh, you mentioned Elizabeth Warren, the Consumer Financial Services Bureau, which has saved people billions and billions of dollars against large institutions. They had no chance to operate as a market force. Where does that line become less blurred and, and how, how much more of that kind of help are we going to need in the future? Yeah, I'm glad you gave me a chance to clarify what I'm talking about. So with um, regulation in general, I'd say there's two types of services. We should look at things that are frequent and low cost of failure, like taking an Uber. I mean, you can figure out what's going to be cheaper, an Uber, taxi, Lyft, any of these things pretty easily. And you know, psychological research has shown humans are very rational and smart when it's things you can do over and over again, and there's a low cost of failure. So there, I think the market does a great job of regulating. With something like, let's say, brain surgery, you're buying a house that you do very infrequently. I mean, I don't think you're going to be hopping on Yelp to figure out which brain surgeon you want to go to if you have an aneurysm or something. Maybe. This is serious. Maybe. But, <laughs> but those are things where I think there's a much better argument for regulation, where there's a high cost of failure and they're very infrequent so that we can't learn from past experiences. Uh, so I wish regulators would just start at least approaching it from that way, asking the question, can the market and the community on a whole who's empowered through online interaction solve this? And with uh, the second point I wanted to bring up is for things like post-action enforcement, I think that's where the government comes in and does a much better job. What I don't want is the government telling entrepreneurs how they can meet customers' needs. But if something goes wrong, I want the government to hold these companies liable. So rather than prospectively you know, regulating and trying to think that they can see the future, what I want them to do is when something goes wrong, then step in. Some people aren't satisfied by that because they can never accept it. It's what's known as the precautionary principle of regulation. You have to prove yourself entirely safe before you're allowed to operate. That might sound good on first glance, but we would never have any progress. Because you can never, with a free market, with a dynamic economy, you can never prove that nothing's going to go wrong. But what we've learned is that time and time again, when we allow new technologies to open up, it makes customers safer and it gives them more options. Thank you. As you see, Jared is a free market advocate, not an anarchist. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Bill Blackman here. Um, did you ever get to Cancun? Yes, yeah, I did go down there. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> And then the other uh, solicitation rules exist in the whole condo industry uh, under the house rules and so forth, making home ownership uh, to do Airbnb much easier. 
be, uh, because there's not this whole other lot. So in the free market, when you have to try to liberate owners of condos to have the same kind of uh, free regime and access that you're talking about, there's a whole other layer. Uh, maybe you have some comments on how that can be uh, done. And right now in Hawaii, we tax single family homes at a lower property rate than we do condos. Phil, go ahead with your question. Oh, you want comments? Uh, the, yeah, the, in the other comment, um, no, we can leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll appreciate your comments. So what I'd say, I, I think you're talking about like condo boards or homeowners associations, things like that. Sure, we can have bans on using it for short-term rentals if it's some private contract, but also what I've been seeing is that people who don't want their neighbors renting out on Airbnb, rather than going through their condo board or talking to their HOA, I call it like lazy nimbyism, lazy not in my backyard. It's when they go to the government and say, you know what, let's just ban this and say we can't have it because I don't want it in my neighborhood. Well, if you don't want it in your neighborhood, buy into a neighborhood with an HOA that doesn't allow it. Or, and if, if that's the case, I, I would personally rather buy into one that does allow it because it would make my home more valuable. And if we'll constantly hear about people, let's say, well, I don't want uh, you know, a bachelorette party staying there, or I don't want, oh, I don't know why anyone wouldn't want that to stay, but... Uh, <laughs> Sorry, my wife is in the audience. Why don't you wife? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but they, they'll bring up party houses or too much congestion, you know, parking on the street. Well, we have existing nuisance law. Let's use that first before we go through a blanket ban. So that's what I'd like to see happen. I just want to make a comment yeah. real quick. I find it very interesting that for 10 years, myself and 10 other homeowners within two blocks have been hosting international students, right? For 10 years. Chinese, Korean, Japanese strolling through our neighborhoods. No one had a problem with that. Now all of a sudden, I'm a couple from New York, and the whole neighborhood's going up in arms. <laughs> <That's laughs> okay. Thank you. Now we got Rob Burns. <laughs> I, I'm curious. Uh, what do you think would be the best way to um, cure our state's uh, excessive need to control and regulate? Um, my family has been doing this since 1820, first boarding house in, in the kingdom, and. Um, and, and as some of you don't know that the Washington place was a boarding house prior to the, the uh, Amen. Tenant, tenant of the uh, queen for, you know, for that time period. But you know, um, Hawaiians have been sharing our aloha, our food, our homes and stuff for years without pay. And so now that there's pay, it's, it's no good. But I think that you know, Hawaiians culture and the sharing uh, economy is not new to us and we'd like to continue to participate but with pay. Right. Yeah, and I'd Thank say you. just to re-highlight a stat I brought up earlier, the number of vacation rentals in Hawaii has grown no faster than 4% a year since 2008. So it's not a massive increase that we've seen, yet now everyone's freaking out about it because it's more visible. And opponents, especially those in unions and those in the hotel industry, are taking notice of this. You would think hotels wouldn't be threatened. I mean, they had their best year on record last year. Yeah. In, in, over the, I know in Hawaii they've had a, a few problems, but I think that extends far beyond just short-term rentals. But it's something that it, – it's a bigger pie. It's creating more options. But we actually had a leak to the New York Times uh, of the hotel industry's annual meeting where it came out with their point-by-point -point playbook of how to counter Airbnb. And it said, pick faces that we can show who are being destroyed by Airbnb. Their families, their lives are being destroyed by Airbnb. In DC, they tried to do this. They've been running, they wanted to run a commercial. Uh, and it was a woman from Anacostia, which is uh, uh, one of the highest unemployment rates area in DC. So it's an older African American woman talking, and she says, This isn't my community anymore. I don't even recognize it. You know, Airbnb just has all these tourists here. I, I don't know what to do. Turns out she's an actress from Brooklyn. So uh, some of my friends who work on this issue are actually, they filed a complaint with the FTC that that's, uh, you know, that's false advertising. You, they didn't have anything saying, you're a paid actress, not real Anacostia woman. But this is the events they'll go to because they cannot find anyone who's been harmed by this. What are you going to say? Well, I just don't like having that you know, American couple stay in the neighborhood. That's not a legitimate complaint. So we're having fear mongering, we're having lies be spread. So I think the best way to counter this, to finally ask, answer your question, is just point out the nonsense of their arguments. Again, it's 0.2% of available housing units being taken off the market. You seriously think that's what's causing high rents? 
And then the vast majority of Americans, besides the very vocal minority, love the sharing economy. They have very high approval ratings of this. Let's use this to make them connect the dots on other regulation. That when you get between someone and their Uber, there's no faster way to turn them into a free market advocate. Make them connect the dots to some other things as well, and maybe we'll have some progress on regulation. With all that passion, I need to give a disclaimer again. Jared's organization and the Grassroot Institute are not paid by any sh home sharing companies, Airbnb, or <laughs> Uber to endorse. We just are promoting the free market, okay? A former regulator here in the state of Hawaii, Illinois, <laughs> join them. So, I did do some regulation. My parents were a small business entrepreneur. So, um, just to, I want to make two comments. One, <clears throat> with respect to the, the bank, uh, Consumer protection idea. Um, the banks are a little different from, say, uh, a rental or other things. Uh, so not everything is the same thing. But if you have a bank that is taking other people's money and is using fractional reserve lending to, there's not it's not all in there. It's being lent out, and you have the FDIC backing it. <clears throat> this is not the same case as a Uber case. Or, so free market, yes, but one has to look at the specific facts of the situation. Some things call for. When they're taking your money and putting it in place and you can't control it, it, it does call for a little bit more regulation possible. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is that your comment about how the market's changing, I have warned my friends on the left about that too, because they built a whole model off of unions and civil rights and on the labor side, on uh, discrimination lawsuits. So if, and I said, look, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're an independent contractor, or an economic vagabond, no sense suing yourself for bigotry. <laughs> so the whole model is, is for their whole model is, is is potentially disintegrating. So, but they don't want it. they don't want that to happen. So they just need to be helped to kind of evolve. And well, and I think that's where you're seeing the Thank biggest you. opposition come to this independent work. I'm glad you brought it because if you're an independent contractor, you can't collectively bargain. Which is, you know, if half if half of a certain group of workers wants to join a union, then everyone's uh, covered by that in non right to work states. So with independent contractors, though, it shouldn't matter what another entrepreneur thinks. I should be able to do my own thing. So there's good reason that they're not allowed to collectively bargain. But with unions now, especially among young people, having less than 4.5% of young people be members of unions, which is the lowest on record, they realize they need more members. So in Seattle, they actually passed an ordinance that allowed ride-sharing drivers and taxi drivers to collectively bargain, even though they're independent contractors. A court put a hold on it because that... It's not allowed under federal labor law, but this is the push we've seen. We even saw the Teamsters saying, you know, don't let the sharing economy fool you. There's nothing more about this. It's just rich capitalists exploiting the workers again. I'm like, what's being exploitive about, you know, a, a mom, again, who wants to go and work while her daughter's in preschool? Like, if she can only work three hours a day, what's bad about that of allowing her to have an option to earn some money? What's bad about allowing a student to drive her Uber in between their classes or help rent out one of their apartments that they're living in with their friends? I don't see how that is taking advantage of workers at all. We even had Robert Reich, a former Secretary of Labor under Bill Clinton, he said what should be called the share the scraps economy. But again, he's taking a view that he's only looking at Uber drivers, which may make, you know, depending on where you are, let's say $15 an hour after expenses or $12 an hour. Uh, that's we'd obviously want people to get higher wages, but when we're talking about lawyers, accountants, again, graphic designers, interior designers, all these people who can now work for themselves and have more options, this is something that is not just, I would say, low-paid work. It's all throughout the economy. Thank you. Faith Burns. And they call uh, conservatives dinosaurs, but you know who the dinosaurs are? Are the people like Bernie Sanders and others that can't see the paradigm shift that people aren't going to just join unions and, and do business as it was when they were. I mean, that's that's just nuts. So part of my question was, I think Rob touched on it, you know, how do you get them to, how do you get the lawmakers to realize that this thing is a wave that's coming and they need to get on it? And then the other thing was, I'm going to just play the devil's advocate a bit and say this expanded pie that you're talking about of consumer and or tourists is that a good thing? I mean, in Hawaii, obviously, that's, our economy is based on tourism, and yet there's a saturation point. Nobody knows what it is, where it's just too damn crowded. You know, everybody's get, feeling that, and you know, because of social media, every single site you go to is just like super crowded. And I don't know how do you how do you get the people to not be nimbies and not worry about overcrowding and 
if everybody opens up their house to a B and B, which of course wouldn't happen. You say it's two percent, but more and more, then more and more people come. We don't have the infrastructure and. Yeah, I think that's something, though I'm not a big fan of excessive zoning, considering that Honolulu has uh, Wharton School of Business rated it as the most restrictive housing market in the entire U.S., which is even worse than San Francisco, which like legitimately just hasn't built anything in like a decade, even though they've seen rap rapid growth. So I think you can address that through zoning. That's a debate to have there. But once someone has property, I don't think you can tell, like if you're allowed to rent it out for long term, let's say 30 days, which... I mean, you're always allowed to do that. Why does it matter if you rent it out for 29 days? Why should that all of a sudden be illegal? And if we have things now, they're saying, well, short-term rentals, we should make them have to have sprinkler systems. We should make them have wheelchair ramps, all these different things. If that's truly necessary to protect public safety, every house should have to have it. If it's doing long-term rentals, if it's just owners staying there, I don't care. If it is truly necessary, make it apply to every single residential unit. That's what Arizona did. They're the only state in the U.S. that has a statewide preemption of local governments flat out banning short-term rentals. They can still regulate to protect public safety, but it has to apply to everything. It can't just single out one part of the market for, as Dr. Akina talked about, unfair treatment and picking winners and losers. Thank you. Nancy Lambert. So I just wondered what you would uh, suggest as a solution to our, our lawmakers' inability to figure out how to handle the situation in Hawaii because you cannot get a bed and breakfast permit any longer. There's not very many, correct me, somebody if I'm wrong. Well, they ran, I know on Maui they ran out of them like 20 years well, ago they, outside they of the They stopped zones. issuing them, I think, somewhere in 1987 or something like that. So there's very few legal bed and breakfasts or vacation rentals on this island. And so the legality in all the residential neighborhoods is a 30 day or more rental. However, is that correct? However, the other, the uh, the state still wants the tax money. So, you know, they can't figure out what to do. So what yeah, would I think you suggest? The best thing we could do is point out, so two years ago there was a bill that went to your governor's desk that he actually vetoed that would have allowed these online platforms to voluntarily collect taxes and then give it to the state. It was estimated they would have got $26 million a year, which is a 33% increase from those types of taxes. That's real money that you could use. So I think maybe politicians will understand money. I, I don't know how else we could bring that up. I mean, but... Will Rogers says we have the best politicians money can buy. So that would be my thing is just bring that up and then also talk about right now it's happening. People are using Airbnb, quote unquote, illegally, and the sky isn't falling. Let's not make criminals out of ordinary Hawaiians who are just trying to earn you know, a few thousand extra dollars a year. Now we have two more people who are going to ask questions, and so we'll call it after Moni. But uh, I invite all of you to stay around and meet Jared personally and ask him your questions face to face. Mark Monscalco. Sure, thank you. It's a very interesting subject. Um, I'd like to make some comments rather than ask questions, but if there's something I say that needs to be corrected, please jump in there. The thing that I find most intriguing about this is the government right now is fixated on the peer-to-peer -peer networks that are attacking their favorite targets, uh, the government's favorite uh, protected industries, taxi cabs, hotels, that sort of thing. Uh, and the regulators and the politicians are focused on that. And in the meantime, the rest of the world around them is a, a tsunami that they're not looking at. The peer-to-peer -peer industry today offers options for citizens to basically um, eliminate the need for many, many government services. It's very, very small at this point, but it's growing dramatically. But you're going to get to the point where you'll have competing uh, security services that compete, that compete directly with uh, your local police department, with your fire service. You've got, right now, we've all got the ability to use cryptocurrencies. You have the ability to use a peer-to-peer -peer network that competes directly with the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury. And the fact that you know they're focusing on Airbnb and, and silly things like that, I think is actually a benefit to us. They're distracted, <laughs> and eventually they'll be just out of work, and we'll, we'll have a bunch of happier life. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate that. By the way, Mark Moscato is a member of the board of directors. Thank you. Thank you.
Two more then. Okay. Catherine, okay. absolutely. Thanks. So Moni first and then Catherine and then we'll cut it off today. Aloha, Jared. Aloha. Okay, so I have a quick question. Other than writing my letters and going to each of my legislatives personally to their office to have a conversation with them, what else can I do to get Airbnb moved in the right direction so that it's considered legal? Because I'll say this, when I went to go meet with my legislator from Hawaii Kai, and I spent an hour and a half with him, he said to me, Momi, that was the best education I ever got from one of my constituents. I will now, I now have a better understanding of what, of what's going on and what we can do to move this in the right direction. But he's one person. What else can we do? Well, I think uh, I'm glad you're talking to your legislators because too often I've gone to these sorts of meetings, whether it's with occupational licensing or, or legalizing some new technologies, where the only people who show up are the established interests who want to keep their protection around them, their government protection. So you're doing the right thing by talking to them. I think it's just allowing you know, regular Hawaiians to realize the benefits. I'm not of regular. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I should say I, every, th those people who aren't, uh, who haven't been able to use these services to realize what they are. So the more you can just talk to people about it, just talk about the benefits of these services because all they're hearing is the high rent arg, you know, that nonsense. So talk about how it's helped you personally and you know, continue to go to these meetings because too often we don't have enough voices standing up. For, we all benefit from services in this new type of technology or new type of economy, but it's rather small benefits all added on top of each other. Whereas the taxis where they have a legal monopoly they have a lot to lose. So they're going to spend all their time and resources fighting back against this new thing. We all have a little to gain, so we need to really make our voices heard to happen. Thank you. And our Thanks. final question today is from Catherine Tensky. Catherine. Hi, Jared. How are you? You know, several people in this audience have asked you one single question, and there's only one single answer to that. How do we make this different? How do we change it? Elect new people. Well, thank you. Okay. you know, that last question was so good. We'll let Doris ask the final last question. Our third and final last question. Doris has the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I date back a few years. In fact, um, we bought a beachfront home in Holly Eva, 1979, when our two sons were 12 and 13. And our account says you can't keep it yourself, you gotta rent it out. So we did. That was before 1989, <laughs> which the city council passed an ordinance to help people with noise, traffic, and parking, which was already handled by the police department. So it's a law that's been on the books since 1989 that they did allow a few people that were already in the business, which we were. So I have a non-conforming use permit from 1989. But before that, we were, anybody could rent out their house uh, as personal, private property. And so I've been fighting the battle since 1979. <laughs> And maybe by the time I reach 100, something, <laughs> will, happen. something will happen. Let me just. Oh, okay, you go ahead. Um, this is news. The Hawaii Tourist Authority, which just came out with a study, and they're the first time ever that they've come to our rescue. They said Hawaii tourism industry supports 190,000 jobs and generated 15.6 billion in visitors spending and 1.82 billion in state tax. Maybe we'll get some relief. Thank you. Thank you, Doris. Thank you, Doris. Appreciate it very much. Any last comments, Jared? And then we'll say aloha for now. Well, I'll just say I am optimistic about this. As I talked about, it's 
the younger generation, they get this. They're not all socialists, no matter what this last election would have you believe. But I've talked to over 50 college campuses last year. I could not find a single millennial who wanted the government to tell Apple how many iPhones to make or what features to put in the iPhone. They don't understand true socialism. What they do understand, though, is the benefits of disruptive technology and what uh, we've been able to achieve now because of these expanded options and more information. So I think when you're, you're talking to your kids, talking to your grandkids, if for some reason they don't understand free markets, just point out that Uber is the perfect example of what can happen when we break down a government monopoly and let freedom of choice for consumers win out. So thank you. Thank you very much, Well, we close out the formal portion of the program, and uh, thank you for those who are viewing.